this video let us discuss about forward and backward propagation so i have taken a data set here i have given values for x and y so x values are 0 1 2 3 and 4 and y values are 0 4 8 12 16 what do you infer from this data so if i ask you to find out the relationship between x and y will you be able to make it I'll give you 10 seconds time. Can you please find out that? Yes. So what is the relationship between the two? Yes, you are right. So immediately we can say that y is equal to 4x. Yes. But just imagine that the machine do not know the relationship between x and y. When there are multiple features, it is going to be a tedious task. Okay. So now what will happen, randomly, randomly, the machine may choose y is equal to 2x. Okay, just an example. Okay, so as an example, what I'm trying to say here is the machine is first randomly taking the relationship as y is equal to 2x. So what is 2 here? 2 is the weight over here. Okay. So what is this x? These are the values of x. Clear? Okay. So now the x values are written. The actual y. Now predicted y. So how to predict this value of y? y is equal to 2x. Right? So 2 into 0, 0. 2 into 1, 2. 2 into 2, 4. 2 into 3, 6, 2 into 4, 8. So now let us try to find out the squared error. So we know that how to find out the error in regression, right? So the predicted y is calculated and now we are trying to get the squared error, which is nothing but y minus y hat the whole square, right? So 0 minus 0, the whole square, which is 0. 4 minus 2, the whole square, that is 2 square, which is equal to 4. 8 minus 4 is equal to 4. 4 square, that is 16. 12 minus 6 is 6 square, that is 36. 16 minus 8 is 8, the whole square, that is 64. So when you add it, the total error is equal to 120, right? So now how are we going to proceed with this, right? Now let me explain that here x value actual y and weight is equal to 2 this is the squared error we got right now the next thing what may happen is two things will happen like uh, the one thing like the weight is increased by certain value it is increased by 0 0.0001 so weight is 2.0001 right so now let us understand this is the actual x, oh sorry, this is the x. So 2.0001 into 0, that is 0. 2.0001 into 1 is this, into 2, into 3, into 4, right? Now we are trying to find out the squared error. What is meant by squared error here again? So actual y minus this one, right? So 4 minus 2.0001 the whole square, that gives you 3.99. And 8 minus 4.0002 the whole square will give you 15.99 and so on. So now the error is, now the squared error or the loss is equal to 119.988. Now the weight is reduced. Now the weight is reduced from 2 and now 1.9999, right? Now the predicted value of y is being calculated, right? So again, now 1.9999 into 0, into 1, into 2, into 3, into 4. What is the next step? Yes, you're right. So we have to find out the squared error now. Now the squared error is being calculated. Now the squared error is being calculated and the total is 120.012. It is very simple. 
when the weight was 2, the squared error is 120. When the weight is increased, the error is decreased. When the weight is reduced, when the weight is reduced, the error is increasing. So what is the right idea now? The weight has to be increased to reduce the loss. So now let us look into this diagram, right? So here weight is taken in the x-axis and loss is in the y-axis. So we, we have started with weight equal to two and the loss was actually 120, right? So when the weight was increased, we could figure out that the loss was getting reduced. Now, uh, you already found out that the right relationship between X and Y in this example is Y is equal to 4X. That is why here you can see that there is no loss. When you calculate Y is equal to 4X, there is no loss. So here actually this part represents negative slope negative slope when there is a negative slope the weight is getting uh, the weight is you no know, like when there is a negative slope what is happening like the weight is getting increased right so the weight is getting increased and here you can say that it is a positive slope right positive slope right so the process by which we calculate the derivatives needed in the calculation of weights is called back propagation. So let us understand what this is, right? Okay. So in back propagation, what happened? We initialized with weight is equal to two. We got some loss value. And then we were trying with several weights. So we were working backward, right? So we were just adjusting the weights and based upon that, we are calculating the loss, right? So what is feed forward neural network? It is an artificial neural network in which connection between the nodes do not form a cycle. In this network, the information moves in only one direction from the input nodes through the hidden node and to the output nodes. So here it moves forward and it does not form a cycle. Inputs are fed by a series of weights, which is then computed by hidden layers. The hidden layer's job is to transform the inputs into something that the output layer can use. So hidden layers use activation function to map the resulting values in zero or one. So this is what we have seen in forward propagation. You can see input, predicted output, and then the derivative, right? And then the derivative, right? So let us understand that. So actually what we have done, we have not updated the weights fully, but only by a fraction. See, we were increasing by 0 0.0001, right? So this is how we work on this. So input is passed, and then we'll be getting the output, and then the loss is being calculated, and then loss in the sense like we are finding out the derivative and then we are adjusting the weight. This is how the process continues, right? So this is basically a forward propagation and this is backward propagation, right? Now look at this diagram. What do you understand from this? So here you can see that there are four inputs or nodes in the input layer and two nodes in the hidden layer and one node in the output layer. So these lines indicate the connection each node has with the node in the layer, next layer. So the connections are through the weights involved, so which can be learned via forward and backward propagation. So let us understand this, say, okay, so let it be this W1. So this is W1 and let this be w2 right right this is b this one is actually w2 right so now if i try to find out the relation what can i write now h1 is equal to w1 x1 plus w1 x2 plus w3 x1 sorry w1 x3 right so w1 x3 
plus W1 X4. So let me show you how uh, this part is working. Like W1 X1. So I'm writing for H1, right? So if you see, again, you can see that uh, like W1 X2. So that is also fed to hidden layer one, right? So W1 X3, W1 X4. Similarly, I can write for H2 also. So when I write for hidden layer two, so can you tell along with me? So I can write that X1 into W2, right? Plus X2 into W2. Yes, plus X3 into W2, plus X4 into W2. Hope it is clear to you, right? So what is this W? W is nothing but the weights that connect input layer to hidden layer. So we have a set of weights from hidden layer to the output layer, right? Okay. So here, uh, in case we are tasked to classify items such as uh, digits from zero to nine, right? So in that case, we will be having 10 nodes. Each digit is represented by one node in the output layer instead of one, right? So hope it is clear to you, right? So the same points are given over here. So this is the visual representation of uh, forward and backward propagation. So there is input layer and you can see one hidden layer over there. See, there could be any number of hidden layers. So that can be decided by us, right? And so what is happening? Uh, so here uh, the inputs are passed to the hidden layer and then we are getting the output, right? So that is forward propagation. Then the error is being estimated and based upon that we are adjusting the uh, weights, right? We are making some changes over there, right? So that is backward propagation. So this is just a, uh, just an overview of uh, forward and backward propagation. Hope it is clear to you. So ultimately, what are we doing with this gradient descent? Just imagine that, like I was showing you a curve, right? So now just imagine that this boy is blindfolded and his aim is to reach this position. Now just imagine that if he is keeping larger step, if he is keeping larger step, there may be a high possibility that he may fall instead of that, what I say is like he may go here. If he keep larger step, he may go over here, right? It is just an imagination, right? Now in case if we keep smaller steps, what we can expect, it may take a longer time to reach this lake right so this is the simple example to illustrate about uh, gradient descent so gradient descent is an optimization algorithm used to minimize some function by iteratively moving in the direction of steepest descent as defined by the negative of the gradient so in machine learning we use gradient descent to update the parameters of our model what are parameters Parameters are coefficients in linear regression. In neutral neural networks, it is called as weights. So this is the visual representation of gradient descent. Just you can have a look at it. Now we were discussing about the loss function, right? So this loss function or cost function or error function tells us how the model is at making predictions for a given set of parameters. So when weight was equal to two, how good my model was. So I'm just with the help of learning rate and I'm learning and I can understand that if I increase the weight, definitely there will be a reduction in the loss. Accordingly, I'm moving and at a place of four, I can find out the error is actually zero. We cannot always uh, go for zero error because that is not possible with the real world data set. That is highly impossible. So always try to find out the minimum loss, right? So the cost function has its own curve and its own gradients. The slope of this curve tells us how to update our parameters to make the model more accurate. So to this one like we can say that like here the slope is being negative right 
so from that we can find out that the weight has to be increased so here it is uh, the slope is being positive right so we can say that the weight has to be yes decreased so this is what we will be trying to understand from the loss function so now what do you understand from this yes you are right we have reached the question right now when we talk about gradient descent there are uh, three primary types of gradient descent that we are using the machine learning and deep learning algorithms a data set may have millions or even billions of data points and calculating the gradient over the entire data set can be computationally expensive so batch gradient descent stochastic gradient descent mini batch gradient descent when we talk about batch gradient descent in batch gradient descent we process the entire training data set into one iteration so weights are updated once an epoch is completed when we train the model to optimize the loss function using the mean of all the individual losses in our whole data set it is called batch gradient descent what is stochastic gradient descent in stochastic gradient descent we process a single observation instead of entire data set from the training data set in each iteration so we calculate the error gradient and new weights and updating the model for each observation in the training data set so this is a changed version of the gradient descent method where the model parameters are updated on every iteration it means that after every training sample the loss function is tested and the model is updated these frequent updates result in converging to the minima in less time but it comes at the cost of increased variance that can make the model overshoot the required position but here the advantage is that it requires lower memory as compared to the uh, previous one like previous one in the sense like gradient descent because there is no need to store the previous values of the loss functions now mini batch gradient descent so here the model parameters are updated in small batch sizes it means that after every n batches the model parameters will be updated and this ensures that the model is proceeding towards minima in fewer steps without getting derailed often so this also results in less memory usage and low variance in the model so here basically we process a small subset of the training data set in each iteration so it is a compromise between these two gradient descent batch gradient descent and stochastic gradient descent so batch size is a very important hyperparameter it can vary depending on the data set so deciding the batch size is again a very crucial step now the momentum based gradient descent so based on the first order derivative of the loss function we are back propagating the gradients right so the frequency of updates can be after every iteration a batch or at the last but we are not considering how many updates we have in the parameters if this history element is included in the next update then it can speed the whole process and this is what momentum means in this optimizer the history element is like how our mind memorizes things if you are walking on a street and you cover a pretty large distance then you will be sure that your destination is some distance ahead and you will increase your speed right so this element depends on the previous value learning rate and a new parameter called gamma which controls the history update so the momentum algorithm accumulates an exponentially decaying moving average of past gradients and continues to move in their direction one simple technique for dealing with a problem of widely differing eigen values is to add a momentum term to the gradient descent formula so this adds inertia to the motion through weight space and smooths out oscillations momentum can improve the speed of the optimization process in concert with the step size improving the likelihood that a better set of weights is discovered in fewer training epochs so momentum helps in accelerating sgd in a relevant direction 
So it's a good idea to also consider momentum for every parameter. The advantages are it avoids local minima. As momentum adds up speed and hence increases the step size, optimizer will not get trapped in local minima. And the second advantage is that faster convergence. So momentum makes the convergence faster as it increases the step size due to the gain speed. The next one is Mistral Accelerated Gradient. The momentum-based gradient descent gave a boost to the currently used optimizers by converging to the minima at the earliest. But there is another problem. This method takes a lot of U-turns and oscillates in and out in the minima value, adding to the total time. The time taken is still way too less than normal gradient descent. But this issue also needs a fix and this is done in this method. So the approach followed here was that the parameters update would be made with the history element first and then the derivative is calculated, which can move it in the forward or backward direction. This is called a look ahead approach and it makes more sense because if the curve reaches near to the minima, then the derivative can make it move slowly so that there are fewer oscillations and therefore we can save more time. There are several other variants like vanilla gradient descent, momentum based. Now when we talk about adaptive learning rate, it could be adagrad, ada delta, or a misprop. And there is another one called a combination of momentum and adaptive learning rate. Vanilla gradient descent is the simplest form of gradient descent technique. Here vanilla means pure or without any adulteration. Its main feature is that we take small steps in the direction of the minima by taking gradient of the cost function. Adagrad keeps updating the learning rate instead of using constant learning rate. It accumulates the sum of squares of all the gradients and use that to normalize the learning rate so that now the learning rate could be smaller or larger depending upon how the past gradients behave. That is very nice, right? So it adapts the learning rate to the parameters, performing smaller updates for parameters associated with the frequently occurring features and larger updates for parameters associated with infrequent features. So that is why it is well suited for dealing with the sparse data. So for a sparse feature input, where most of the values are zero, we can afford a higher learning rate, which will boost the dying gradient resulted from these sparse features. If we have a dense data, then we can have a slower learning. So the solution for this to have an adaptive learning rate that can change according to the input provided. So Adagrad optimizer tries to offer this adaptiveness by decaying the learning rate in pro proportion to the updated history of the gradients, how nice it is. So it means that when there are larger updates, the history element is accumulated and therefore it reduces the learning rate and vice versa. But there is one disadvantage. Learning rate decays aggressively and after some time it approaches to zero. The next one is about ADA delta and RMS prop. Adagrad accumulates the sum of squares of all the gradient and use that to normalize the learning rate. Due to this Adagrad encounters an issue that we discussed, the learning rate in Adagrad keeps on decreasing due to which at a point learning almost stops. So to handle this issue, Ada Delta and RMS prop decay the past accumulated gradient so only a portion of past gradients are considered. Now, instead of considering all the past gradients, we consider the moving average. So basically it is an improvement to the Adograd optimizer. It reduces the aggressiveness of the learning rate by taking an exponential average of the gradients instead of the cumulative sum of squared gradients. So it remains intact as now exponential average will punish larger learning rate in conditions when there are fewer updates and smaller rate in a higher number of updates. The next one is ADAM, Adaptive Moment Estimation. This combines the power of RMS prop and momentum-based GD. 
in adam optimizes the power of momentum gd to hold the history of updates and the adaptive learning rate provided by rms prop makes adam optimizer a powerful method this is the most powerful method actually it also introduces two new hyperparameters beta 1 and beta 2 which are usually kept around 0.9 and 0.99 but we can change according to the use case so the task of a gradient descent optimizer is to find out the optimal weights for the parameters but sometimes it may end up in finding weights which are less than the optimal value which leads to inaccuracy of the model ideally our sgd should reach till global minima but sometimes it gets stuck in the local minima and it becomes very hard to know that whether our sgd is in global minima or stuck in local minima so how can we avoid this local minima increasing the learning rate if the learning rate of the algorithm is too small then it is more likely that sgd will stuck in a local minima we can add some noise while updating weights so when we add random noise to weights this also sometimes help be helpful in finding out the global minima assign random weights repeated training with a random starting weights is the most popular method that we try to avoid this problem but here the problem is about the computational time we can use large number of hidden layers so each hidden node in a layer starts out in a different random starting state so this allows each hidden node to converge to different patterns in the network parameterizing this size allows the neural network user to potentially try thousands of different local minima in a single neural network hope this is clear to you so here we have discussed about the, the optimization algorithms and this is really important to build a neural network